All right, Elton. Well, a lot of tributes have been coming in surrounding the life and legacy of David Stern. Why don't we just start with you describing him in the first words that come to your mind when you think of David Stern? Uh, first words that come to my mind is you know, innovator. You know, he was a thought leader, much much um, ahead of his time, and growing growing our game, growing the NBA, growing this brand, um, in a way he related to the stars and pushed it to grow around the world and globally it's just just a special thing you can go to my laptop i'm gonna pull up some archive photos we're gonna go back to june 24th <laughs> 1999 here you are on stage in a very nice looks like navy suit shaking hands with david stern as the number one pick in the 1999 draft tell me about that night special feeling special feeling uh you have a dream that comes into fruition you know it's Growing up in Peekskill, New York, it's like, ah, you know, no one ever made it to the NBA from here. <laughs> Why should I think I will? You know, and, but you see David Stern shaking the hands of, you know, all the first-round draft picks. And, you know, when it's your opportunity, it's just, it's a relief. It's elation. You know, all he stood for, all the NBA stood for, it's just, it's just an honor and a privilege to play and get drafted and to shake his hand. It's like a, it's like a ceremony. It's like a ceremony. And he had been at it, David Stern, for a while at that point, probably around, I think, if I'm doing the math correctly, 15 years as commissioner at that point. So you growing up watching on TV, I mean, this is the rite of passage. <laughs> like, it's a defining life moment, and there's David Stern up on stage making it official, right? The rite of passage. You see it on TV, you see um, the NBA draft, you see the handshake, and, you know, now I'm up there. So all these feelings went through my mind. I see my mom. You know, I see my family. I'm looking at him, and it's just, it's just, a, it's a great feeling. I know players have a variety of reactions when they're finally up on stage. Some can recall it vividly. Others describe it as like a blackout type <laughs> moment. Did he say anything to you? Do you remember any interaction you had with him on that night? Um, he always would talk about me being from Westchester, New York. You know, he's a New York guy, and he's like, you know, nine one four Westchester, and it was like a nod because you have, you know, the commissioner like showing you love like that and knowing about your area and things like that. So that was a special feeling. It was a sense of pride that I felt knowing he was from the area and he you know, would talk to me about that. It's funny, too, because in reading a lot about his life and some of the write-ups and obituaries and features about him since he passed away, is there's no question the word tough was used to describe the way he would handle his business at times. He probably had to be. I mean, you could speak to that, I'm sure, yourself. But he could also relate to guys, like that interaction right there, right? So what do you remember about how he dealt with players? And, and that's a great point. You know, you see the, the narrative of, you know, business person, tough. Um, but then you also have the side where he related to the players. He related to us. He, you know, very personable, charismatic person. And it, and it was genuine. Like, this is business. This is who I am. You know, we can talk and we can be friends, but if we have a deal, we need to get the best deal for both sides and make sure that we can grow this business and grow this pie of the NBA, which he did for the players. Any other specific moments with him personally for you that you can remember? Um, so that was the beginning. And then even, you know, in the last two years, he came to our facility in Camden um, gave us gave a talk about innovation with a company that he was working with and just sharp and bright and, you know, and still thinking about the future of growing brands and just the way his mind worked. It, it always sat with me. You're someone who it always seems like takes advantage of opportunities to go abroad, represent the game, represent the sport. That was a huge part of his tenure as commissioner, growing the game globally. Why is that such an important thing? Why did that message and focus resonate for you you know basketball the nba sports you know breaks a lot of barriers around the world so when we went to asia uh, with the nba i went to russia with the nba i went to mexico with the nba and to see the fans um just to see the, the smiles in their faces they knew the players you know that's there's like elton brand 20 and 10 you know and it's just like wow like how do you know who i am how do you know about the nba how do you follow this like they did um, and just growing the business of it and also relating to, to different cultures. I'm going to pull up one more photo. I think this was from 2006 from a European tour that you were a part of. I see Tim Duncan in there, Andre Godal, Sean Marion, Tony Parker, Steve Nash, David Stern. When he would accompany you guys on trips like this, 
how close was the interactions with players? Were there certain things that he spoke to you about as far as the league's responsibility to promoting the game overseas and abroad? Absolutely, absolutely. And it'd just be him and us. It wouldn't be a lot of, you know, other staff or employees. He'd just want to relate to us, you know, as a group and, and uh, as a leader and get our thoughts and what we didn't like, what we felt we can do better or what the league could do better and um, really caring is, is what we felt. We felt that he really cared about us um, and he wanted to care about the business, but he cared about us as, as humans. Early 1990s, summer of 1992, Barcelona, Spain. <laughs> I remember growing up watching that. That was the moment in basketball for me that turned me on as a fan. What was that like for you, following the dream team in the summer of 92? Uh, following the dream team is just an <laughs> uh, amazing uh, you know, example of you know, the greatness of the NBA players, um, the visibility of the NBA players you saw around the world, they were rock stars. You know, everywhere they went, it was crowds and Michael Jordan and, you know, Scottie Pippen and Barkley and, you know, Magic Bird. Like, they're just rock stars around the world. That was my first time, you know, really understanding that it was bigger than the U.S. The NBA was an actual global game. And Davis Third played a pivotal part in allowing NBA players to represent their countries in the Olympics and I further represented the USA in in many competitions but we're talking about opening doors that's another door he opened up another thing that happened under his watch too was the evolution of the superstar era not just in the NBA but really in sports because I think a lot of people would identify the NBA as being the league that has been at the forefront of embracing the individual as the superstar so playing in a league where there was freedom of expression seemed like your personalities to come out what was that like just knowing that there was that context as a player yeah that context is is wonderful to see you know you see from you know different ads from different brands that you can actually you know, be yourself. You could actually say what you have wanted to say, have an opinion. Um, and it wasn't about just catering to what the NBA needed and what their messaging was. You can be free. You felt free um, being within the NBA under his leadership for sure. And he's left a you know, great legacy that we continue to, to, to pave that path for, for future generations. But again, he started with that. He pushed the superstars and, the, you know, the, the Michael Jordans of the world and just how that blew the NBA up to just the level that it is now. And there have to be moments where as players you're certainly in tune and focused on big decisions that a commissioner has to make, whether it's involved in the CBA or something like the incident at the Palace in 2004, the implementation of a new dress code. How, how closely as players did you guys follow that stuff? Um, you or follow you personally? It. No, no, you follow it. Like I was on the board, I was on the committees, and you know, I represented the team. Um, you know, in some of those meetings, and it's, he was quite honest. It's like, we need to clean this up, you know, consumers, um, television, you know, he explained it in a way that you said, okay, this is bigger than me at this point. Fair or unfair for me to not wear a, a throwback jersey or do something on the bench, you know, want to look professional, we understand, um, or, or the CBA what I'd say disagreements, like figure out where we're going to meet at. It's like, you know, again, it's it was all cordial. You know, we saw how some of the messaging was he was tough, but it was never, you know, to the bitter end, like we can't grow our business and figure this out. Let's figure this out was the message. Think about some other big basketball moments from your lifetime, still in your youth, when Magic Johnson went public with his HIV and David Stern was one of the people seated up there on stage during his very public press announcement. Whether it was at that moment then or years later, what did the symbolism of him being there and the subsequent support the NBA lent Magic Johnson have? Uh, it's great symbolism. It's great support. And it was needed, you know, just from an educational standpoint. I was a kid, and I'm thinking you can get HIV from someone shaking your hand, from sweat, and I'm just like, oh, they're going to play against them. Other players may have came out and said some things at the time, and it's like for him to stand up, um, you know, in hindsight and kind of create create a barrier from that stigma, and it, this is not true. You can play. You can, you know, have a life. You can live with HIV, um, and we're going to support one of ours that's dealing with this issue. It, it was a great statement. Was your most recent encounter with him when he visited here back in 2017? Yeah, that was the most recent and last encounter. 
what what did he seem like to you then? Did it seem like he lost his fastball, so to speak, uh, at all? Hey, that's my point. No, his mind was sharp. Um, still thinking about the future. Still thinking about brands. Still thinking about growing companies. Still cares a lot about the NBA, and still talked about Westchester. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, I guess in summing this up, um, are there certain things that uh, you either as a player, maybe looking ahead to your future, admired about his leadership style or certain things that you find in your day-to-day now leading an NBA franchise that he set a model for, an example for? Um, not being afraid to push boundaries. You know, he we talked about, you know, the Magic Johnson support. We talked about innovation. For example, you know, he, he's adopted the, you know, the three-second rule. Um, in the NBA so that, did, you know, you could have freedom of movement. You can have space. You didn't have to be arms linked away from your man. Um, the post, I played in the post. It was great, but it was not aesthetically appealing to the global community. You want spacing. You want it to move. You want, you know, soccer style. You want guys or, or women to be free to shoot, to move, to pass, to play. And I think that's helped grow the game today, just that the way the game looks. So being creative I'm um, not being afraid to push any boundaries. I think the last thing I'll ask about is um, the implementation of the WNBA and the G League happened on his watch. What does that do for a sports league? How much more well-rounded does that make a sports league with innovations like that? Uh, it, it it totally makes the, the sports leagues um, you know, much more well-rounded, gives everyone an opportunity to compete. You know, I, I know my daughter, we watch college, we watch WNBA, um, you know, just the G League, you have an opportunity because it's not just about the NBA. It's about basketball. It's about sport and what that can do to communities and what that can do for people. That's all I need. Excellent. Elton, thanks so much. No, of course, man. Thank you.